Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we are so glad to have you for this session entitled Social Justice Masterclass, Reflections of a Legendary Civil Rights Lawyer on 40 Plus Years of Legal Practice. Um, the title in and of itself of this session really encompasses the privilege that we have tonight to hear from um, the one and only Professor Ted Shaw. Um, he is the Julius L. Chambers Distinguished Professor of Law and the Director of the uh, University of North Carolina Center for Civil Rights. Um, he teaches civil procedure and advanced constitutional law. His research areas include the 14th Amendment, affirmative action, housing policy, and housing policies regarding fair housing. Um, he is a story civil rights lawyer. Many of you may know him um, as one of the former directors of the, legal de the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, but my, the, the thing that personally close to my heart, um, is my and my name is Mark Wright, and I'm the president of the Columbia Law School Black Law Students Association. And Professor Shaw is a distinguished Columbia Law School alumnus and a former member of the Columbia Black Law Students Association. And so we're just so excited to have um, this space tonight to hear from him about all of the things that he's done in his career, the, the lessons that he's learned, um, the things that he wants to share with you all tonight who are aspiring law students trying to figure out where you fit into legal practice, where you want to pursue your legal education, where you want to make change in the world. And you've all made a wonderful choice tonight to hear from this, as the title says, social justice master. So with that, I will open it up to Professor Shaw to share with us. Well, thank you so much. I'm honored to be here uh, with you. Um, uh, as you've indicated, someone who's at Columbia Law School, part of uh, Columbia Balsa. Um, and uh, as you share with me, you're from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I'm, um, uh, I've been all over the South over my years of being a civil rights lawyer, including uh, in Memphis. And um, I'm honored to be with you. Uh, and I want to thank Tammy for her help in um, facilitating this, uh, this whole discussion. Uh, and I want to lift up Evangeline Mitchell. I can't remember now um, because I have um, CRS disease. Uh, do you know what that is? Do you, know, you don't know what that is. Huh? CRS, the C stands for can't, the R stands for remember, and you'll have to figure out what the S stands for. But um, I can't remember how long ago I met her. Um, but she is, from my perspective, uh, a young attorney, um, and she's a, uh, a, um, a tremendous uh, young attorney. And she's taken the initiative uh, to keep the pipeline of African-American students um, into law school and into the legal profession going. It's not something that she has to do. Uh, she could easily uh, focus on uh, her own professional experience and making money, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but she's very much committed um, to keeping that pipeline going. Um, I... Uh, I respect her deeply. She's courageous. Um, she's honorable. Um, she is um, uh, one who is taking or has taken the baton um, and is running her part of the race uh, with respect to uh, the work that uh, many of us are committed to. Um, I want to say a quick word, if I may, about some of the difficulty that popped up earlier today um, with respect to the Zoom bombing of an earlier session with uh, Professor Brian Fair, whom I haven't seen in a, a long time, but I, I know Brian. I haven't seen him, as I said, in quite some time. Uh, you know, UNC and Chapel Hill in North Carolina 
is in all that far from Alabama. And uh, perhaps when we get on the other side of this pandemic, um, uh, I'll see him because I'm going to find my way over for a number of reasons to Alabama once again anyway. Um, uh, I was um, briefed by um, uh, Attorney Mitchell about what happened. I um, hope and I, I pray that those who are uh, participating um, in these, what is it, three days, uh, I hope that they are not discouraged by what happened. Um, there's a lot I could say about those who were responsible for this. It obviously, uh, it's not the work of people who uh, can count courage among their attributes. Um, and it's a terrible thing to do, but uh, we can't let it get in our way. We can't be discouraged. I, I hope the young folks who are interested in law school don't let it get in the way. I told Attorney Mitchell, and I'll say more about him in a little while. Uh, it made me think about um, uh, Julius Chambers. I hold this endowed chair in Julius's name. I'm going to tell him about you. Or rather, I'm going to tell you about him. Um, I wish I could tell him about you. Julius is gone. Um, but Julius was a great lawyer, um, very low key, one of the great lawyers in this country. Um, along the way, as you will hear, uh, he was threatened in many occasions. And at one point, he was giving a, uh, a speech to uh, some members of a black community. Uh, uh, he was representing them in challenging segregation and discrimination in Eastern North Carolina. And uh, in the middle of the speech, uh, a, a huge explosion uh, occurred outside of the, the uh, building that he was speaking in. And everybody rushed outside uh, to see what had happened. And Julius calmly went outside and he saw that um, the explosion was uh, his car. Uh, it had been uh, firebombed. And he looked at the car and he quietly turned around and went back inside and he finished his speech. Uh, that was Julius. And the point that uh, I'm making is probably clear. Here we are living in Zoom world. We're living uh, in another era, uh, an era that's much more technologically advanced. Um, and uh, yet what happened today in some ways may be uh, analogous to what happened to Julius when he was given that speech and the people who were listening to him. Um, Julius didn't let it get in his way. Uh, nor did those people. Uh, we can't let uh, a Zoom bomber uh, get in the way of what we're trying to do. Uh, their actions say more about them and nothing about us. What says something about us is what we continue. I frankly, and I'll get off of this in a moment, uh, uh, a big part of me feels... Um, uh, the word sorry comes to mind, but I uh, feel some pity for those who either are so confused about the realities of racial inequality in this country that they don't understand that a program that aims to open up opportunities and encourage uh, young Black people to become lawyers because the proportions of lawyers who are black in this country are abysmally low uh, and sadly unrepresentative of uh, black folks um, proportions in the uh, um, in the country uh, demographically um, and what some people don't understand is that um, there's no symmetry between efforts to try to 
uh, encourage young black people to become lawyers and get them to uh, serve their communities and beyond um, uh, doing the work that lawyers do on the one hand um, and being conscious about trying to open those doors uh, and uh, discrimination that's intentional, that's based in uh, antipathy and hatred, uh, the desire to exclude on the other hand, uh, you know, with all due respect, and I would encourage people of all races and backgrounds who are inter interested in, uh, in becoming lawyers uh, to do so, uh, including white folks. But white folks are not underrepresented in the legal profession. Um, uh, and so there's no symmetry between the two. I could say a whole lot about that because I've been involved in the struggle to keep the doors of opportunity open in higher education uh, in many ways for decades now. Um, and so I'll, I'll just say that uh, uh, some people don't understand, some people willfully refuse to understand, uh, but uh, those who are participating in this program don't for one moment um, feel in any way that what you're doing is uh, comparable to racial discrimination because it isn't. Uh, uh, so don't hesitate about that. Uh, and I want to speak partially in a personal way. Uh, I never used to do that, um, but the older I get, the more um, I do that. And I, I hope you bear with me. Um, uh, I was, um, uh, I turned 66 um, uh, the week after next, and I was born in the year of Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, you know, Brown was May 17th, and I was born in November of uh, 54. Um, and on a personal note, uh, uh, I come from uh, a family background that I describe as schizophrenic, and there probably are some of you who still uh, well, who could say that? And by that, I don't mean mental health, although those are serious issues also that uh, almost every family, um, uh, you know, deals with uh, in one way or another. Uh, but what I mean is that my um, maternal grandparents were Harlem middle class. Um, uh, they had a brownstone in Harlem. Uh, they were relatively well off. Uh, anybody from New York and many people not from New York may know of the uh, Abyssinian Baptist Church uh, in Harlem. Uh, they were the first couple to be married in the present uh, church sanctuary back in 1924. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother, uh, used to brag about this stuff all the time. Um, uh, so they were... Um, they did okay, although they had the kinds of challenges life would bring. My mother, um, uh, I see some, there's an Abyssinian who uh, just said, that's my church. Well, um, I'm glad to, glad to hear uh, uh, of you um, online. Uh, my mother died when I was um, just shy of three years old, and um, I don't know where my father was, but we lived with my grandmother and grandfather. He died uh, a year later. Um, so while they were fairly well off, uh, Harlem middle class, life wasn't always easy. Uh, life isn't always easy. Um, on the other hand, my paternal grandmother was, um, uh, she was um, a single mother at a time when that was the uh, the Scarlet Letter, um, uh, never married. Um, uh, my father was her whole life, and she was, as many of the women in our family were uh, in that era, uh, and for a long time, she was a domestic worker. Uh, you know, she was four feet nine inches tall. She, I remember seeing her on her hands and knees, scrubbing floors, white folks, 
um, you know, ironing their clothes. Uh, she would care for her children. She never even had her own place to live uh, because uh, she was spending the night at the places where she worked in a little, you know, uh, wherever she could find a spot to sleep. And uh, when she stayed with, uh, with us, um, she would often sleep across the foot of my bed. Um, she was four feet nine. She could almost fit across the foot of my bed, but not quite. I'm telling you all this story for uh, a reason. Um, I love both my grandmothers. I love my paternal grandmother dearly. Um, uh, but here's the thing. Um, she had nothing uh, but on uh, August 28th of 1963, um, and by this time my father had been married, we lived in a public housing project in the Bronx. She spent the night with us and then she got up that morning, she wanted to take me with her. My stepmother um, uh, feared what could happen. So she said, no, I've always regretted to that. But my grandmother got on a bus and went down to the great March on Washington in D.C. Uh, she was there that day. Um, there were so many times, there are so many times in which I see photographs and footage of the March on Washington. Um, and I'm always looking for my grandmother, uh, even today. Uh, knowing I'll never see her, uh, there were 250,000 people there. And my grandmother was four feet nine. Um, so that's not going to happen. Uh, but I've been so proud always of the fact that that's what she did that day. That's the way that she could um, uh, do something uh, for civil rights and for the civil rights movement. Uh, the civil rights movement was the stuff of my youth. Uh, uh, I seem to remember, though perhaps I'm not sure, um, on the radio uh, in my grandmother's uh, Brownstone in Harlem, hearing the news blaring about the Little Rock school crisis a few years after I was born. Um, I do know that for many years, I had a image in my head that I thought came from a dream. And the image was of people laying on the east end of 125th Street, for those of you who know Harlem, um, uh, near the entrance ramp to the Triborough Bridge, now the Robert F. Kennedy Bridge, and they were laying down in the street, um, blocking traffic, cars, trucks, buses, hon horns honking, honking, people angry because they would, were unable to get where they were going. I, I never could make anything out of what that imagery was. I thought it was a dream until I was in college and I was doing some research and found out there were demonstrations against um, uh, the refusal of employers in the department stores on 125th Street to hire black workers. And I, I must have seen that with my grandmother. Um, I remember going to Abyssinia and hearing the great Adam Clayton Powell Jr. preach, congressman from Harlem, when there were only two congressmen men from Harlem and, and for decades, uh, um, uh, a Congressman Lawson from Chicago and, and Adam Clayton Powell Sr., or Jr. rather. Um, uh, all of this was the stuff of my youth. Um, I remember being on a bus going across 125th Street with my uh, bourgeois grandma and um, passing a platform and a crowd of people speaking um, and uh, I said, uh, well, uh, rather a speaker, one man speaking, a crowd of people listening. And I said, Grandma, who's that? Who's that man? And she said, oh, some black fool. Uh, that was my grandmother because it was Malcolm. And my grandmother was a Martin Luther King kind of woman, not a Malcolm X kind of woman. Um, I was both uh, in time. Um, but I'm saying all of this to say, this is the, 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 the soil from which I grew. Um, and the most important thing was the civil rights movement uh, at the time of my youth and in time, the black consciousness movement in the late 60s. Um, uh, I could tell you about my memories of the night Martin Luther King 
um, speaking of Memphis, was assassinated and where I was and how I found that out. Um, um, but even before that, I came to the conclusion that I wanted, just like my grandmother went down to that march on Washington, I wanted to have my place. I wanted to do my part in the struggle for uh, the rights of black folks. And I concluded, although God knows how, because I didn't know any lawyers, that law was the best way to do that. I had made up my mind, even when I was in grade school, and certainly when I was in high school, that that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I had no idea how to get there. Um, uh, and um, uh, I will skip some of it, but uh, I was in a group after Martin Luther King was killed um, that was a leadership project for young black men. And it was through that group that I began to become more aware of the opportunities that might be available for higher education because it was not a foregone conclusion that I was going to college. Um, uh, and I found my way to college. Uh, again, I won't tell you all the details of that, except to say that um, I found my way like many others in my generation because of uh, what became known as affirmative action, uh, particularly after Dr. King was killed and these institutions uh, consciously opened their doors to um, uh, black and brown people who historically had been excluded. Um, uh, so before I knew it, um, I was at Wesleyan University in Connecticut, but I also was moving toward um, trying to figure out how I would get to law school. Um, uh, you know, long story shorter, uh, I ended up um, at Columbia Law School. Uh, and while at Columbia, uh, I took a class by um, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a man who was an adjunct, um, who was the second head of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, Jack Greenberg. Um, Jack succeeded Thurgood Marshall, uh, of whom I had learned and whom I knew about. Uh, indeed, I would say there were very few Black people in the late 50s and early 60s who did not know about Thurgood Marshall. Um, he was uh, the lawyer. Uh, the stories go that uh, when he was coming to town, they'd just say the lawyer's coming. Um, and everybody knew who they were talking about. Um, so I admired him greatly. I did not know much about how Thurgood Marshall became the Thurgood Marshall that we now know uh, he was. Uh, uh, most law students, and I would say most um, uh, college students, those of you who haven't applied to law school, never heard of one of the greatest lawyers in this country. He did as much as any lawyer um, for the United States to make it um, the country that it uh, promised it would be. Uh, and that was Charles Hamilton Houston. Um, a quick word, uh, if you don't know who Charlie Houston was, he was from Washington, D.C. He grew up uh, in the early part of the 20th century. His father was a lawyer in D.C. who had a kind of um, regular practice, uh, did wills and divorces and criminal law and uh, all the things that general practitioners did. Um, uh, Charles Houston grew up in, uh, uh, after high school, and he went to one of, I think he went to Dunbar High School in D.C., uh, but he went on to Amherst College, one of the best liberal arts colleges in the country, and uh, was Phi Beta Kappa there, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the only black students at that time. Um, at Amherst, his cousin, um, whose name was William Hasty, was there. Um, you know, they were very close. Um, and so Charlie Houston graduated near the top of his class um, in the early 20s and went on to, uh, to attend um, uh, the 
uh, Harvard Law School. And um, I think he was on Harvard's Law Review, I think the first black student uh, there, but was uh, an excellent student and graduated from Harvard, came back to Washington, D.C. There's a reason I'm going into all of this. Uh, went into practice with his father. Uh, and along the way, his father started representing black men who were discriminated against, charged with uh, uh, things that uh, they were either innocent of or uh, for which uh, white people, white men charged with these crimes would get either no penalty or lesser penalties. Uh, and he started working with the NAACP. Uh, and so did Thurgood. Um, in time, Thurgood also began to teach part-time at a night law school. Um, and uh, eventually uh, they brought him on full-time. Meanwhile, he was still practicing law. Um, you know, think about that, uh, two jobs. Uh, and he became the dean of that law school uh, and turned it into a full-time law school, but also into a factory in effect uh, for producing civil rights lawyers. Um, Thurgood Marshall was one of his mentees, um, as was a lawyer by the name of Oliver Hill from Richmond, Virginia, um, and uh, countless other lawyers, uh, but particularly Thurgood and Oliver Hill, um, who uh, Thurgood graduated from the top of his class um, in 1933, I think it was. He had been denied admission at the University of Maryland Law School because of race. Um, he never quite got over that, um, uh, was involved with suing them later on on behalf of uh, someone else uh, who was black and wanted to attend. But um, uh, Charles Houston became the mastermind. I think this session um, talks about a master class. I'm not a master. Charles Houston was a mastermind. He masterminded the um, legal struggle uh, that led to Brown versus Board of Education. He trained lawyers, um, uh, turned them into the vanguard uh, of uh, the civil rights legal effort and movement. Uh, I wish I had more time to tell you about Charles uh, Houston, but you should go and and, and read about them. There's a book I have on my shelf here called Groundwork by um, a dear friend, Jenna Ray McNeil, and it's the story of Charles Houston. Uh, Charles Houston never got to see the culmination of his handiwork. He died in 1950, four years before Brown was decided. But when Brown was decided, Thurgood Marshall, who uh, was by that time the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, which was uh, the brainchild of Charles Houston. Um, he thought about Charles Houston in that moment first uh, and last. Um, uh, you know, part of that effort involved uh, his cousin, um, uh, whom I mentioned. Um, uh, you know, he, um, uh, William Hasty, who became the first black federal judge. Um, the other lawyers, and these are people, if you go to law school, uh, I urge you to learn about them. I'm talking about the staff of the Legal Defense Fund. And at that time, the Legal Defense Fund and the NAACP were joined at the hip. Uh, but I'm talking about um, uh, Jack Greenberg, Robert L. Carter, Constance Baker Motley, James Nabrit, uh the third, uh, but James Nabrit. Uh, Jr., who argued one of the Brown cases. Uh, I mentioned Oliver Hill, um, uh, Lou Redding, and Charles and John Scott out in Kansas, uh, who worked on Brown. Um, Bill Coleman, the great Bill Coleman, whom you should learn who he was. He was the first, or rather the second African-American cabinet member in the United States, um, Secretary of Transportation under President Ford, the first Black cabinet member was uh, Bob Weaver, who was a board member for the Legal Defense Fund, and Secretary of Housing and Urban Development. Um, uh, you know, Spotswood Robinson, another one of the great judges. Um, uh, so learn about these people. 
learn about who these um, lawyers were. Uh, Constance Baker Motley became the first black woman uh, to be a federal judge on the Southern District of New York. Uh, a great judge, a great woman, a great um, uh, civil rights lawyer. Um, uh, to be as I became uh, uh, affiliated with the Legal Defense Fund to get to know many of these people. And I got to know almost all of them, um, some of them very well, some of them not as well. Um, uh, but to be affiliated with them was one of the singular honors of my life. Uh, there were two jobs I wanted uh, after I went to law school and when I went to law school. The first one was the Justice Department Civil Rights Division. The second one was the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. Now, the thing was, you didn't call the Legal Defense Fund, they called you. Um, uh, and eventually I was called and I, I won't bother to go into all of that. But uh, here's the other thing that I want to tell you about. Um, the cases that the Legal Defense Fund did were a vitally crucial part of the civil rights movement. Uh, the Montgomery bus boycott that catapulted Martin Luther King Jr. into national and international fame. Uh, in 1956, that bus boycott um, uh, was uh, a movement of people. Everybody knows who uh, Rosa Parks was. Most people think, uh, uh, you know, they believe the myth that she happened to be just tired one day and sat down on the bus. Rosa Parks just didn't happen to sit down and refuse to give up a seat. Uh, she was an NAACP member and an activist. And this was part of a plan to challenge segregation uh, in public transportation. Um, uh, the reason that I'm mentioning this though is that those men and women walked for a full year. But in the meantime, there was also a legal challenge to segregation and public transportation uh, in Montgomery. Um, and it was litigated by the Legal Defense Fund. Uh, the case was called Bowling versus Sharp. And while the bus company eventually was going bankrupt because of the, the money that it lost because of the boycott, uh, Bowling versus Sharp worked its way to the Supreme Court. And it was that decision by the Supreme Court in 56, two years after Brown, um, that uh, put the nail in the coffin of segregation of public buses. I mention this because of the importance of the relationship between activists and lawyers. Uh, it's a mistake to think that lawyers can lead movements in their role as lawyers. Those movements are doomed to failure. It's not that lawyers don't play a crucial part, an important part, but lawyers should not think that they can do it all and turn activists into bystanders. And so that's one of the lessons that I learned. Um, uh, I wish I had more time to talk about uh, Brown versus Board of Education, those five cases that were decided. But let me turn to, and some of the other great lawyers, uh, Wiley Branton and Little Rock, um, who litigated the Little Rock School case. Um, uh, let me turn to Julius Chambers uh, quickly and then um, uh, try to wrap this up. Uh, Julius was born in Depression era in North Carolina in a small town called Mount Gilead. His father had a, um, uh, a car repair, truck repair shop. Um, and public schools in uh, Mount Gilead for uh, black children were, uh, with all due respect, uh, it wasn't the fault of those who taught there, uh, but because of the resources they didn't get, they were uh, not very good. Um, Julius's parents decided they would send his older brother to a, a private school for black students, um, as they did, um, uh, you know, Julius's sister. Uh, and they planned to send Julius also, uh, but they relied upon money that uh, they were making that his father was earning from repairing a truck. It was a big job. And uh, he maintained this truck for this white man who bought it in. 
and the white man didn't pay for it after all the work was done. Julius' father tried to get him to pay. He refused to. He wanted to get legal recourse. He couldn't because nobody would take the case. Julius watched as his father fumed and with exasperation and anger. And Julius at that moment decided that he would become a lawyer one day. Um, and he did not go to that private school. Uh, fast forward, he attended what was then North Carolina uh, College for Negroes, now North Carolina Central uh, in uh, Durham, which is right next door to where I am right now in Chapel Hill. Uh, and um, he graduated through hard work uh, near the top of his class. Um, and he decided he wanted to get a master's degree in education, strengthen his educational, um, uh, rather in history, his educational credentials. He went to the University of Michigan, uh, not many black folk there at that time, got a master's degree and came back to North Carolina, decided he would apply to law school. There were two law schools he applied to, North Carolina Central, the historically black law school, um, uh, and uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the state's flagship law school where I now teach. Uh, he um, uh, um, was, as uh, he was told, the last student accepted into his class at UNC. Um, the dean told him, Chambers, you'll do just fine. Just don't mess around with any white women. That was not on Julius's mind, and he was married anyway, and I don't think it was on his mind or would have been anyway. Um, uh, fast forward three years um, when Julius graduates. He graduates first in his class in 1962. Think about that a minute number one in this class. And as uh, Elaine Jones, who was the fourth director counsel of the Legal Defense Fund, I was her deputy before I became the fifth director counsel. We were going to Julius's funeral a few years back and uh, with another friend, a lawyer from North Carolina. And we thought about Julius being number one in his class. And uh, uh, one of us said, if Julius was number one in his class in 1962, it couldn't have been close. Uh, I want you to reflect on that for a minute. Um, uh, and not only was he number one in his class, but he was editor-in-chief of Law Review. Um, that was unheard of. Uh, that, if you don't know already, is the most prestigious uh, position a student, a law student can hold. Um, uh, and yet, uh, in the annual soiree that the Law Review had at the um, end of his third year, Julius couldn't even attend. Editor-in-chief of Law Review couldn't attend because it was held at a country club that was segregated. Uh, Julius didn't have an easy time at UNC Law School. Um, none of the faculty uh, to speak of, maybe one exception, um, would really try to help him uh, seek employment. Usually they'd fall over backwards for the editor-in-chief of Law Review and first uh, top-ranked student in the class. Um, uh, Julius ends up um, uh, skipping over some things, uh, being the first intern in a program created at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, the first two, the other one was uh, Marion Wright, now Marion Wright Edelman, head of the Children's Defense Fund, another great lawyer. Um, Julius spends a year or two in New York. He gets another degree, law degree from an advanced law degree from Columbia, comes back to North Carolina with the help of the Legal Defense Fund, sets up an office and starts doing civil rights cases. Um, uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is enacted, the Voting Rights Act of 65, um, other civil rights statutes. Julius uh, litigate school desegregation cases and public accommodation cases, employment discrimination cases, um, uh, voting rights cases, uh, housing discrimination cases after uh, Dr. King was killed. He becomes the great lawyer in North Carolina for civil rights cases, starts the first racially integrated law school, uh, I'm sorry, law firm. Along the way, his house is bombed. His office is bombed, as I told you. His car was bombed. His father's house was bombed. Julius was low-key. Nothing ever got in his way. 
He litigated in landmark cases, Swan versus Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education, which began to implement uh, desegregation in the South um, 16 years, 17 years after Brown. Um, the major landmark employment discrimination cases um, that uh, were litigated after Title VII was enacted, uh, Griggs v. Duke Power Company, Albemarle versus Moody Power Company. He's one of the great lawyers. He becomes the third head of the Legal Defense Fund, um, a friend for me, a mentor, a boss, one of the great lawyers. Um, and I want you, obviously, I wanted you to know um, who he was. Um, uh, I have a list of people that I don't have time to tell you about. Um, uh, great African-American lawyers, great men and women, um, uh, judges, some of them, uh, Gabby McDonald uh, uh, on the um, uh, Court of Appeals in, uh, uh, down in Texas, uh, in the Fifth Circuit, um, uh, and uh, A. Leon Higginbotham on the Third Circuit Court of Appeals, Nate Jones, uh, general counsel to the NAACP, and eventually uh, on the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. There's a lot that you can be proud of. Uh, finally, and I will stop here, um, uh, I, um, I have up here a book uh, in my library of uh, uh, the National Bar Association in 1935, I think it is. Um, you know, prominent in that book is Charlie Houston, whom I told you about. And, um, the beginning of the career of uh, Thurgood Marshall and others. Um, I hope you learn about these people. You don't all have to be, and you won't be civil rights lawyers. I hope some of you are. Uh, corporate lawyers, uh, you know, I have um, a dear friend who became Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder, um, but also Loretta Lynch, um, who succeeded him as Attorney General. I know people who have um, our uh, CEOs of major corporations, things that you never dreamed uh, your friends or you would do. Um, so the doors are open to you if you push your way through. Um, don't let anybody discourage you. Uh, your future is bright. Um, there's so much more I could say. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done. Our struggle isn't over. Uh, as Theodore Newman, who was on the uh, um, Washington, D.C. Court of Appeals, uh, said many years ago when I was a law student, and I reminded him not long ago about hearing it because it had an impact. He said at a luncheon where I heard him speak, there's no room in our struggle. There's no place in our struggle for the summertime soldier. Um, I want you to remember that and think about it. Um, uh, I... There's so much more I can say. I've spoken too long. Um, God bless each and every one of you. Um, you know, come and take the baton. Uh, run with it as far and as long as you can. Um, and then pass it on to somebody else. Thank you so much, Professor Shaw. Um, I know that if we were uh, in a room together, um, people would be on their feet and applauding because that was such wonderful um, history that you gave us, such wonderful advice that you've given us and such a charge um, that you've left us with. Um, we have, I've been told that we have a few additional minutes um, for uh, a few questions from our audience and I've received some questions in the Huba app. And so for those who would like to hear the answer to that, you are welcome to stay for a few additional minutes. I mean, for those who have to transition at the original 7.30 in time, we thank you so much for attending. Um, the question that I think we'll start with is a, actually a combination of two. Um, what does the civil rights fight look like for the next generation? And how can the, the uh, lower courts aid in creating precedent to ensure rights such as marriage protection, rights to abortion, rights to family planning, the right to vote, and all of these other important civil rights that we gain. Thank you for that. Um, and whoever asked that question, but let me start with the last part of that first. Sure. Um, the lower courts, obviously 
uh, and I think about this on this day in which the Harvard case was decided by the uh, um, First Circuit Federal Court of Appeals that will be, uh, and that case will be heading to the Supreme Court, a good chance they'll take it. And I usually don't say that about the Supreme Court because it's a fool's errand to predict what cases they're going to take. But this case is really important along with the UNC case that's now in federal court here in North Carolina. Um, uh, obviously the record at the trial court level is everything. You know, um, the record which uh, uh, contains the facts that will um, uh, be reviewed by the Court of Appeals. And so uh, trial lawyers know um, that the record is everything. Um, uh, obviously, uh, it's the facts and the law, uh, both of those things. But, uh, you know, if you don't have a good trial record, you're not going to get to the point where you can appeal it. Um, uh, so that's the quick answer um, to that question. Uh, it's also important to not only litigate in federal courts, but to litigate in state courts, um, particularly as the federal courts have become increasingly hostile places. Uh, it's important to, <coughs> excuse me, litigate <coughs> in, uh, in state courts. And um, uh, I think it's important uh, for uh, you in the communities in which you live and work um, to work with uh, people on the grassroots level um, uh, in whatever you do. Uh, that's important. Now, there was something else you asked, and I'm losing it. So remind me. Uh, the other part of the question is just what does the future of the civil rights fight look like for this next yeah. generation of lawyers? You know, I don't think I'm qualified to say much about the future. I'm not going to be here. Um, uh, <laughs> I, um, uh, having said that, uh, I, um, uh, look, uh, a lot of people would have thought that the um, civil rights struggles that uh, we were engaged in 20, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, when I started practicing, uh, even before that, uh, 50 years ago or 66 years ago, <laughs> Um, and when Brown was decided, they would be over. They are not. Uh, we still live in a society that is deeply unequal. Um, we live at a time when, um, you know, racial discrimination um, is, uh, it's changed in some ways, but yet there's still a great deal of racial discrimination and inequality. And sadly, uh, you know, we see more hatred than we've seen in a long, long time. Uh, you know, we live in a, um, an era now where the, uh, uh, where uh, the administration in Washington that uh, is about to leave um, office, thank God. Um, uh, and I don't say that in a partisan way. Um, you, you all know why I say it. Uh, you know, this administration has been engaged in racial discrimination and inequality. Um, it's promoted an agenda that uh, is regressive. And so we're still fighting some of the battles that we fought uh, 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. Um, these struggles don't end. The people who um, we are dealing with now, they're not going away, um, you know, at least not soon enough. Eventually they'll go away because eventually we all go away. But in the meantime, uh, you know, it's important to keep struggling against these folks and what they stand for. Uh, white supremacy um, is on the ropes, but it's not dead. Um, and so the future of civil rights, well, civil rights is bigger than the black-white divide, although that's been this country's longest um, uh, running um, struggle. Uh, but we have to think about, uh, you know, sexual orientation, and we have to think about um, disabilities. I think probably the longer 
um, I've been on earth, the more I began to appreciate maybe the need uh, to think about age discrimination, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, uh, gender um, uh, discrimination. Um, and we have to think about environmental justice issues, the environment, uh, uh, because uh, we all have an interest in that. And at the same time, we are all affected by it. And some of the issues of environmental injustice impact black and brown people more than anybody else. Um, so uh, there's a lot of work um, yet to be done as uh, uh, I didn't mention this and I'll just say in passing, one of the great honors of my lifetime has been able to connect with human rights lawyers around the globe. And I've done work in South Africa as a transition from apartheid. I met Nelson, Nelson Mandela. Um, and others who were uh, the warriors against apartheid. And I've been to um, uh, Japan and to uh, Eastern Europe, uh, worked on behalf of Roma folks, been to South America. Um, it's been one of the privileges, the great privileges of my life. There's a, a tremendous amount of work yet to be done, not only uh, here in the United States, but around the world. Um, and some of you are gonna have opportunities to do that. And some of you are going to have opportunities just to make some money. Uh, but, you know, I hope that that's not all you do. Um, you know, I hope that you use it well um, in the service of others. We, we appreciate that. Um, and that's so true that uh, people will have all kinds of opportunities because of what's opening now. Um, I, I think we have time for just one more question. And the question that I'm seeing um, in the chat now is um, a question about how um, different groups fight for their rights. Um, and the question is um, how really do we elevate black people um, to fight for the rights of black people? Um, and in the civil rights uh, uh, arena, there are all different kinds of rights that have been advanced for different groups, but how do we put black people in position yeah. to advocate for the rights of black people? You know, um, uh, I could give that question more attention than I will. Um, and I say that, um, uh, not because I don't think that that's an important question. And I, I want to, you know, I said I'll speak in personal ways at moments, you know. Um, I love Black people. Um, uh, and we come, just look at me, uh, in all shades. My wife got me a shirt, a uh, T-shirt recently that said something like lightly melanated or something like that. Or... Um, uh, uh, but when I say that, I mean, um, uh, those who are dedicated to the struggle on behalf of Black folks for uh, equal rights and for racial and economic justice, um, those are the people I, um, that, uh, whom I admire. You know, if I could turn around this Thing is show you my bookcase here, the NAACP. I have all of Langston Hughes's um, writings. Um, I have Malcolm and uh, the Nation of Islam, um, uh, Marcus Garvey. I could go on and King papers here and his biographies. I could go on and on about that. I love black people. And there's still a need. It's not that I don't love other people too, but I especially love black folks and the struggle uh, that we've been engaged in for the last 400 years. Um, uh, I hope some of you feel that way and dedicate yourself to that struggle because um, part of my standard speech that I can't give right now puts us in historical perspective. Um, uh, you know, 400 years, uh, only 50 or so uh, of which have been um, uh, 
living in what's now the United States uh, under uh, a, uh, an existence that was not, in which we were not subordinated by law. That only ended in the end of the 1960s. Uh, you know, I said, I remember the night Martin Luther King was killed in Memphis, your hometown. Um, that wasn't that long ago. I know to you all, it seems like it was, it's Jurassic, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, uh, and so all of the inequality that we see, whether it's police misconduct, um, whether it's the war on drugs, whether it's health, whether it's wealth, whether it's uh, employment, education, and go on and on. Um, you know, we're not done yet uh, with our struggle. And so I'm urging you all to love black folks, love this country, not for what it is and, you know, the unbroken promises, but what it has promised to be. And find your, take your place in the struggle to make America live up to its promises. Uh, this country doesn't only belong to these folks who think they're patriots, and it surely doesn't belong to the white supremacists. Um, I, I can go on and on. Let me let me rein myself in uh, and stop. Well, with that, um, what a powerful um, ending to what has been a powerful event. Professor Shaw, we thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, I would like to thank all of you for attending um, this evening's event. Um, and I hope that you all will continue to attend the events of this conference um, with the charge that Professor Shaw gave in mind for us to um, take our place and take advantage of the opportunities um, that a legal career can provide. Um, have a wonderful evening and we thank you so much. And thank you, Attorney Evangeline Mitchell. Yes. And thank you uh, for moderating this, and uh, uh, I appreciate you. Thank you so much.